Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from around the world. Thank you for joining us on one of the most important topics we can talk about. It's selling and growing more effectively across borders. Any of us that travels around the world, we uh, are involved with selling. Uh, we, I, in my days, in my early career, that's largely what I did, technical support and selling. And at the end of the day, you're also ending up doing some troubleshooting on a factory floor and things like that. And so many of us in the global tribe, we have to be flexible. We have to be resilient. We have to do whatever it takes. But bottom line is at the end of the day, we've got to sell to maintain that pipeline and maintain our business. And so one of the, our favorite people who is very knowledgeable about that is going to be our moderator today. That's Ernie Watts. He's the executive director of Global Chamber in Chicago. He started this this particular program um, was going to be a live event at Polsonelli in Chicago. Sorry, it didn't work out that way. Things got in the way. But the good news is we're a very virtual organization. So Ernie has taken it virtual and he's got three spectacularly knowledgeable expert speakers on the topic. And we're really looking forward, Ernie, to the conversation. Thanks for leading us today. Thank you, Doug, and thanks for the introduction, and welcome again, everybody. It is a rainy day here in Chicago. Hope it's a little bit sunnier wherever you are. As Doug mentioned, this was originally set up to be an in-person event here in Chicago, which we were going to broadcast out. And, uh, you know, I, I would just piggyback on what Doug said in terms of the importance of selling and maximizing your sales efforts. Even now, what I'm finding uh, with clients and with prospective customers that more than ever, it's really important to stay on top of the activity. And let's be, let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, get, maximizing the performance of your sales channels is something that is really a requirement all the time, whether we're in the pandemic or not. So this is Ernie, you might have to turn off your video. You're, we've got a Wi-Fi issue there. Okay. No problem. It's still a little spotty, but hopefully it comes back to us. I'm, I'm not able to hear Ernie, so we'll get that technical glitch fixed here in a minute. So let me uh, take over, if you hopefully can hear me. Let me introduce you to Zach Zelch. He's the VP of Global Sales at PharmaJet and many other companies. He's really just a, a one-man expert on uh, international sales teams and how to build them and how to increase the velocity of setting them up. He'll tell you, I'm sure, about his YouTube videos, which are spectacular. Zach, would you kick us off, please? Great. Well, th thank you really uh, very much for that introduction. I hope everybody can hear me well. And um, I'm going to jump into this because uh, typically I do this talk in about an hour and I have 10 minutes. So I'm going to do this as quickly as possible. And um, just to let you know, yes, I, I, I'm the VP of sales for a company called PharmaJet. I have a side gig, which is called sale, Global Sales Mentor, where I coach and train and support people who are tasked with uh, global revenue. So for people who are uh, trying to learn or trying to improve what they're doing internationally, uh, please reach out to me. And like Doug said, I put out a YouTube video or on LinkedIn every day uh, dealing with an international sales problem. So uh, Cesar, I'm just gonna say if I could uh, slide down every time, if you don't mind uh, to handle my slide. So slide down. And just to jump into this, about 20 years ago, I go into my first day of a new job. I was hired to be an account manager for a multinational uh, representing one of five uh, account managers in Norway. And my boss says to me, Zach, um, I have a problem. I was given responsibility for South Asia and nobody wants to take it. This has been something that we haven't been able to get moving for years. Uh, we've never been able to be profitable there. If you take this off my hands and you will become the director of sales in South Asia, I promise you an account manager job in Scandinavia in a year if you fail. But if you succeed, 
I'll give you uh, England as a prize. That was what he promised me. So I, I told my wife we weren't going to Norway. We were going to uh, India, uh, slide down Caesar. And I went out to uh, run an organization that had never been able to produce more than about half a million dollars. And I was able to bring it up to about $30 million in uh, about three years. And that was really my first opportunity to have what I would call general uh, sales control, where I could control the strategy and the tactics and the training and all of this, and to put in place a lot of the things that I've been thinking about and reading about and studying about for years. And it showed me that there are really ways to do things a little bit better than what other people are doing. Slide down, please, Caesar. Um, and over the years, I've worked for a lot of different companies. The last company I worked with, I, I helped them drive the, the sale value of the company up to about $400 million. Um, and really, there is no better way to drive up the value of your company than to increase your international footprint. But it also can be very dangerous. It's a very easy way to sink your company if you do it incorrectly. Now, this man right here is Takiro Kobayashi. He is my sales hero, even though he's never really sold anything. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. When he was 22, he had never eaten a hot dog in his life. He was unemployed. He was about 110 pounds, and he was looking for a way to make money, and he looked at competitive hot dog eating, and he realized that people who were in competitive hot dog eating were doing were eating hot dogs exactly the same way as you and I. They were picking it up and they were eating it. But the rules would allow you to, to play around with that. So he joined a competition, he went up, and what he did was he took all the hot dogs, the sausages, and he dropped them into a bucket of oil. And then he took all the buns and he popped them into a bucket of water. And then he took the hot dogs and while they were lubricated, he sucked them down and he took the bread, squeezed the water out and ate it like mush. And he was able to eat twice as many hot dogs as the world champion, even though he had never eaten a hot dog before then. Okay? Now, why do I say this guy is a hero? Because he took something that everybody else is doing and he did it substantially better. And I'm going to argue that we can do that with sales. Everybody on this call is probably thinking, you know, Zach, I've been doing this for a long time. I know what I'm doing. I'm not sure I can improve it. But I believe that we can all look incrementally at all the little details we're doing and we can find ways to improve it. And personally, over my, my career, I've seen this is very possible. I've driven up sales by, by over a thousand percent four times for four different companies, more or less by taking a look at the little things that we're all doing every day and trying to improve them. Down slide, please. Uh, Cesar, slide, please. So the first thing we're gonna do, and we can't avoid doing this, is ask ourselves questions. Why do people buy our products? Who's buying it? When? Is there something that triggers it? And also what would be success for us. And if we don't know these things going in, we're going to make mistakes. And what we're going to find is fixing a new network or fixing the countries that you're selling to years down the road is very, very expensive. Doing it right from the beginning is critical. And the only way you can do it right from the beginning is to think these things through. And what, what I find is most people, when they expand into new markets, do it for the wrong reasons. They don't think through, for instance, why do people buy my product? Well, let's say you know that people buy your product typically as they enter middle class. So you look for a market which, with a very substantial growing number of middle class members. Okay, People buy your product during childbearing years. So you look maybe for a market with a demographic like that. Now that's really simplification, but again, I'm taking something that I typically do in an hour and I'm cutting it down to 10 minutes. So that, that's the basic concept is what you want to do is you want to know why people buy your product, when and who, and you're going to look for markets where you can find large numbers of people who fit these, these demographics. Cesar, next slide, please. 
typically for companies like ours, and by that I mean companies under about $500 million in sales, what you're looking for are channel partnerships, okay? Direct sales internationally for, for companies that are under about $500 million in sales typically are much, much harder to run. And the most important thing to remember about, about a distributor to begin with is there are lots of different distributors and they are a balance of three components, focus, bandwidth, and competency. And you can have the biggest distributor in the country, if they don't have any focus, they're not good for you. You can have the most competent, but if they don't have any bandwidth, they're not any good for you. So you have to find that balance and you have to figure out what that balance is in terms of importance to you. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you go about finding distributors? And again, I can talk about this for hours and hours, and I, I talk with my friends about this, but let's talk about one trick you can do to, to accelerate the process of finding distributors, okay? What I like to do is I like to figure out what my distributors are selling today the distributors that I'm looking for, if I know who my customer is, I know when they buy, why they buy, I know what else they buy. And then I can look for companies that are presently selling to my target customers. And those are gonna be my best distributors. So if I can figure out what they should be selling and I can find a list of distributors for those pro products, and there are a lot of different ways to go about doing that, which I can't really cover in this short amount of time, but if I can find those distributors, those are going to be the distributors that I want to work with. Cesar. And finding a distributor isn't just finding a distributor, it is pitching to the distributor. Because if that distributor, if, you, if the distributor you want to work with doesn't want to work with you, that is going to help you out. So what you need is a strong pitch that is built on understanding why that distributor would want to work with you, okay? What does the distributor want? The distributor wants to make money with as little work as possible and to know that they can trust you. That's really what a distributor wants. So your pitch has to be built around why that distributor can understand that they are going to make money. They aren't going to have to break their neck to sell your product and they can trust you not to pull out of the market, not to go out of business, not to try and split the market with another distributor, and not to try and go direct, okay? If you can put a pitch together that will convince your distributors of those things, they're all, they're, they will all want to work with you. And then you have your choice of the very best distributors. Next, please, Cesar. And then once you've pitched to distributors, next slide. Once you've pitched to the distributors, what you're basically in a position to do is figure out in a matrix, which is the best one. Now, I'm going to typically interview three to five distributors in every market I go into, right? And that might sound like, you know, I'm talking on the one hand of doing things quickly. On the other hand, I'm talking about this. You want to make sure you have the best possible distributor. And if you look for the distributors quickly, you find them quickly, you, you present to them and pitch them, you can do this also quickly. Next slide, please, Cesar. And uh, I, one thing that I've discovered, which is a really good tool for increasing the velocity of signing a distributor. When you find a distributor until you sign an agreement, it can be anywhere from three to six months. That always takes a lot of time. And I can tell you that the distributors are gonna do anything until you have a distributor agreement signed. So one thing that I adopted a few years ago is something that I like to call a letter of intent, an LOI, which basically, as soon as I decide which distributor I wanna work with, I'm going to send them a letter which says, it's our intent to work with you. These are the three basic principles of our agreement. We're not gonna to talk to anybody else for the next uh, uh, 28 days, typically. I wanna give them just under a month. In that time, I expect you to sign this agreement. I send them the agreement. And what I've found is they will always start working immediately when I send them an agreement like that, an LOI like that. And I've never had a situation where I sent a distributor an LOI and we didn't end up signing an agreement. Okay, so this is one way to save yourself 
as much as five months off of the whole back and forth uh, of the agreement, the craziness that happens very often with an agreement. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, stay here for a second, Cesar. And then the next thing is, I do a lot of training with my distributors and I put that directly in the agreement. I'm going to say, well, this is the training you have to do. Now, what I found is one way of, of moving this forward faster is I use a lot of videos to train my distributors. So what I've actually done is I've put about 90% of the training that I'm going to do with distributors I have on videos, which means that I can get that training out there quicker, right? And then I can manage them. I can do additional training and coaching face-to-face. Uh, -face. And then again, your job managing distributors isn't to sit at home and wait for a fact. You know, we used to say we're, um, you know, we're waiting for faxes with orders. Your job is to get out there and manage the distributors. And the earlier you set in place structures and tools for managing the distributors, the better results you're going to get. And that, that's really the key to getting everything moving quickly. Now you have a window of opportunity. Think about this with your distributors. If your distributors are managing, you know, uh, four new product lines a year, then you essentially have about three months to get them up and running. If they're managing 12 new product lines a year, you have a month to get them up and running because once they start shifting to another product that they're more interested in and they're more excited about, you've lost their interest. So you have a window of opportunity to get all of this, the training, the coaching, the agreements, all of these things going. And if you miss that, you're going to be paying for that for years in the future. Uh, Cesar, do I have another slide or am I done here? Oh, and then this is it. I'm just saying, this is the way you're going to be able to really dramatically and explosively grow your international sales, right? I'm not, I'm not in the business of 5% growth or 10% growth. Typically, when you start selling internationally or you take over something that has been handled uh, not so much as a focus of the company, what you're looking for is to dramatically grow it. And if you do things right, you can typically knock this up to the point where you're dealing with 20 or 30 or 50% of your company's total sales should be coming from international. Okay, so I'm just going to end uh, here because uh, I'm trying really hard to stay within the time allotted uh, to me. Um, and what I'll say is please reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, Zach Selch. I have a website, which is Global Sales Mentor. I have a YouTube channel. I put out a video every day on an international sales problem. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Zach. Appreciate it. And my apologies for the technical snafu there at the very beginning, uh, but nicely done. And again, just a reminder, if you're on and listening to the, to the presentation, please feel free to chime in with any questions. You can use the chat box, raise your hand, and we'll try to address those when we come back to the Q&A. At this point, I want to just shift over and introduce Doug Went. He's the Chief Growth Officer at Went Partners. Uh, he's an accomplished executive who developed the Went Partners Business Growth Consulting Model. And uh, Doug, take it away and build on what Zach has already started. Absolutely, uh, Ernie. And do I sound just a little quick sound check? All good? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Excellent. Great. So first of all, I want to say that I think Zach made a, a number of really critical points, and I'm thrilled to follow him because philosophically we're coming from a very similar perspective. Uh, I've spent about half of my sales career with direct sales organizations and about half of it with channel organizations. Uh, I've dealt with both domestic and international. And what I find fascinating, and I'm sure Zach will relate to this, just with a number of the key points that he made is that a lot of people tend to think that when they build a channel organization, that means it's the channel's responsibility to sell and market and not their responsibility to sell and market. And what I always remind people is that you're building a channel to help you sell and market, not to replace you selling and marketing. Now, I'm not talking about undercutting your distributors by selling directly. What I'm talking about is working with your channel partners. So I think a lot of the things that, uh, that Zach's talked about in terms of the culture of distributors, 
Um, certainly true internationally. Uh, honestly, all of that makes sense in the domestic market as well when you're dealing with distributors or, or rep organizations or any other form of uh, third-party channel partner, VARs, et cetera, depending on what industry you're in. You know, Zach talked about three key components in developing your distributor relationships, focus, bandwidth, and competency. And when he described the importance of pitching the distributor, what I was reminded of was not only that distributors, as he's put it, want to make as much money as possible with as little work as possible, which sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually a really good thing. It means distributors are focused on efficiency, which is a good thing that you want to look for, okay? But that they want to trust you. And a lot of manufacturers or tech companies that are building channels don't understand what trust means to a third-party sales partner. It means a combination of training. It means a combination of getting into the field and helping them and letting them know that your presence in a sales call doesn't mean you're going to try to take the deal direct. It means taking the time to deliver training and support and marketing assistance. It blows my mind how many companies develop a comprehensive content marketing program, hire international distributors or partners, and then leave the entire content program in English. Uh, or not, uh, you know, reconfigured, whether it's language or cultural factors for other markets. They don't develop uh, secondary web domains for those markets or other content uh, that is appropriate to their channel partner. It reminds me of an earlier phase in my career when I first started in the electronics industry. Our company, which is a U.S. firm, had signed a very large, one of the largest uh, electronics distributors in Canada. And because the company was so large, 40 field offices in every province uh, in Canada, the original mindset at senior management was, well, we've signed these guys, you know, and they're the largest and they're the best. So now we don't have to do anything, you know, because we went through the effort and they signed with us. In reality, the work begins when you sign the distributor relationship because uh, again, going back to that point about efficiency, the distributor wants to make as much money as possible with as little work as possible. The reason I say that's a good thing is because it keeps them focused on what is going to generate the best value to them. And that's defined in two ways, right? One is margin. Obviously, if you're not giving them enough margin or if you have a product that doesn't move very easily, that's going to be challenging for a distributor to work with. But the other critical factor is support. If you train them, if you provide materials and information, if you provide technical assistance, if you provide uh, sample uh, approaches to different sales situations, constantly bringing your distributors and channel partners together in virtual forums like this or on conference calls or in person. Uh, I remember when I trained a Latin American sales force, uh, we met in Miami, very common thing to do for American companies, meet in Miami, and I thought I was there just to train them. This was, again, pretty early in my career, and I delivered the training, but what I really got was three days of insights into the needs of the Latin American market. The more listening I did, the more I was able to then redefine our strategy. And for the next six months, we focused on supporting those distributors with different information and resources than we had expected. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we focus on, on when, uh, at WEM Partners is not taking the assumptions of one market and bringing them to another. That is true geographically in terms of the global marketplace. It's true in terms of going from one market segment to another. You know, we have a product that works well in healthcare. I'm sure it'll work just as well in professional services. You know, the marketplace is littered absolutely littered with the carcasses of failed foreign transition initiatives. And the bigger the company, often the bigger the flame out. We actually did an article on our blog uh, some time ago about the failure of Target Canada. How hard, you think, could it be for a brand like Target to cross the border into another country that 85% speaks English and that is already completely Com uh, com comfortable with American brands, and yet they failed miserably, absolutely miserably, because they did not talk to anyone locally, get to know the local market. In fact, their strategy, in a nutshell, was to acquire a well-regarded local company, or I'll say national brand, right, but not local to us, a Canadian company, and then eliminate that brand because they're target. 
So they actually generated a lot of negative feedback from the marketplace because they got rid of a cherished brand, replaced it with their own so that they could quickly establish a retail footprint completely violating every fundamental rule of getting to know your marketplace. As an, an example here in the United States, because it's not just going outbound, it's coming inbound. Many of you may be familiar with Aldi, the grocery store chain that came from Germany. They've been here over 25 years. They spent the first 20 years building store by store, a very slow, strategic neighborhood and market specific approach. Uh, they were very actually frugal on advertising. Almost all of their advertising until about five years ago was direct mail in market exclusive to the trade area of the store. Only in the last few years did they start to purchase um, uh, airtime on TV or do other mass market work. Compare that. So, you know, you've got Aldi growing like gangbusters, but doing over a long period of time. And then uh, a couple of their competitors uh, came into the market and said, well, we're going to be just as successful throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at the American market, having no understanding of American grocery uh, tastes or preferences, and other companies have fallen flat. Uh, Ikea is another great example. You know, I always like to say, you know, today's instant success story was 25 years ago, smart strategy. You know, it took Ikea 20 years before they really started expanding across North America. Only after they established the model and really proved it out did they then achieve the explosive growth. Now, I'm not saying that we all have to wait 25 years. What I am saying is that we all have to think very carefully about listening. The most important thing that we can do is listen to in-country partners. That's why we hire them. If it were easy, we would just go do it ourselves, right? It's not easy. Okay? And in fact, the most successful companies, and a couple years ago, the New York Times did a series on this on, uh, in the business section on companies that listen to their sales reps okay? and listen to their channel partners. And even in the United States, even in the domestic market, um, there are some great examples of companies that have radically changed their business strategy because their channel partners or their sales reps in the field said, you know what, corporate, what you think is going to work or what you thought was going to work We've actually found a way to solve the problem for the customer differently. You've got to listen to us. There's more money in these hills than in those hills. Trust us. And I think that's the key point that really everything Zach said goes back to. Trust, trust, trust. You have to trust your channel partners. And you show them trust not only by not undercutting them and going around them, but by investing time and money and people into supporting them. Do that, demonstrate that level of trustworthiness, and they will pay you back in spades. So uh, those are just a couple of thoughts that came to mind, and I'm really excited to have followed on with Zach. Uh, and I think that we're coming to a consensus here about some key priorities that uh, I hope everyone in this webinar will take as key, key next steps for their own efforts. That's great, Doug. Thank you very, very much for that. For, uh, like I said, nice job building on uh, what Zach kicked off and, and got rolling. And clearly working with channel partners is a critical and a challenging but often rewarding uh, approach. Uh, at this point, I want to bring in Gabriela Castro, who is president of Trade in Motion and the, actually the executive director of the Global Chamber in Quedetro, to talk to us a little bit about, and this is a real area of expertise that Gabriela has in terms of helping small and medium-sized businesses enter and expand into international markets. So, Gabriela, adelante, por favor. You'll have to unmute. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Ernie, very much. Thank you, everybody, to be part of the, the panelists, and thank you for the invitation, Doc. I would like to begin talking about only one number, I will say, I, I do business in Mexico, the US and Canada, between the three countries. And did you know that the United States sold almost 300 billion in US sales to Mexico? What does that mean? That there's business. And someone, many people, many companies found a way, found a way to do it. Everybody can do it, but there are some steps to follow for not losing money and getting wrong at the beginning. So what I, what I do with my clients is that first, 
we choose the market or they choose the market. How do you choose the market to enter or expand into a, an international uh, market for an SME, which is harder because of the size and because of the resources? What market are you targeting? You have to study the market. You have to know, to, to get numbers about the market. Why are you choosing that market? Are you familiar with the market? Why do you think that there is a potential? Do you think that your product will sell? All those questions are very important to know if that's what you want. Uh, an example is that, uh, Sometimes I, I had clients that thought that the market in Latin America is the same because everybody speaks Spanish. And I, I've seen people from, that speak Spanish from a culture selling in a different one and they are not successful. They thought that because they speak Spanish, it would be easy. It's not the case. If I want to sell in, in Argentina, it's not the same than to sell in Mexico or to sell in Colombia or you have to know the market. When, when are you entering the market? Do you have a time frame? Do, do you, are you writing a business plan? How are you entering the market with a joint venture? Are you looking for a distributor, a representative? Are you opening an office? You have to ask you all these questions to know if that's really what you want. Do you know your competition? It's very important. Do you know who else is selling the product that you want to sell in that market? What do you know about the market? I mean, uh, who is your potential and perfect client? Describe it. Describe me the client, age, sex, income, interests, hobbies, everything. Is this the client that will buy your product? And why is he buying your product? Another very important aspect is if you are exporting your product, you need to know all the rules, what it takes, the process, Customs, how do you do with customs? Do you know how to do it? Do you know all the process uh, step by step, how, how you are going to enter the market? And something very important, you need support. You need someone who, who knows the market, who knows, the, who has the right contacts, who has the right distribution on the channels, the right distributor, the right partner. An expert can avoid problems. And I uh, totally agree with Zach and with Doug. It takes time to find the right distributor and sign an agreement. And for distributors, it's a little bit, uh, it's harder or it's hard to get a good distributor and manage it and structure the, the distributor according to the product. I agree with Zach when he said that you have to train them. I, I have a, a, a lot of examples. I work in the mining sector in Mexico and there are many international uh, companies that distribute their products in Mexico. And they came to me complaining because they, they had, many of them had a distributor and they had never sold a product in Mexico for years. And, they, and, and the company said, I'm desperate. I'm desperate because my product is not selling in Mexico and we have been in the market for three years. And I said, okay, what about your distributor? Do you know the distributor? Do you know what he does? You have to follow up with him. It's not only that, okay, we sign an agreement and sell my product 
and we stop there. You need to follow up with, with the distributor and to have uh, specific goals. It's very, very important. So the, the, I think that that's, uh, this is for me, these are the steps that, 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 that companies should follow to be really focused on, on, on the questions, what, why, when, how, who, in order to arrive to, to find the right, the right uh, niche of, of your, for your product. And as I said, for SMEs, it's harder. So you have to be really, really focused to have, a, to write a business and very specific plan. We help with that, of course to have all the answers, because if you don't have all the answers, it's hard to, to open a market. And to conclude, I would like to say that it's possible. You see how much, how much business is between Mexico and the US. It's possible. It's hard. You can do it. So dream big. Narrow your dream, write a very good business plan, meditate and visualize your business and go for it. And the most important thing, you need an expert, an experienced person who knows the market, who has the distributor channels, who knows people and have the contacts to support you to enter the, the, the market that you are uh, focusing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabrielle. I really appreciate that. Zach, Doug, great comments. Just to put some things in context here and, and before we segue to the questions, there were some really key points that were made and reiterated by all three of you. And I think, you know, finding the right partners in the right markets, it, it, there's a disciplined approach to doing that that really pays benefits. Uh, putting them, as Zach talked about, on a formal agreement in many cases, that equals commitment by both the supplier and the partner and really leads to a more effective and efficient approach uh, that Doug was talking about. And I think, Gabriella, you, you hit on a key point in terms of the follow-up and the planning. I've seen and experienced a lot of situations where you go in, you find the right distributor, everybody's fired up, you get them out of plan, you, you, you get them out the, the, the door with, with a good agreement and a good approach, but then a year later, two years later, there's a concern about why it's not meeting expectations. And again, regular follow-up and not just time and, and, and being in the market and working with the distributor, but really holding them accountable, having good plans, taking corrective action and constantly adjusting and keeping everybody focused on clear goals is really, really important. So I'll just kind of uh, with that, um, throw out some questions that have come in uh, for, for everybody. And, and uh, in particular, Zach, you, you, we got a question here. You mentioned uh, finding sort of three to five candidates, distributor candidates in a market. So the question kind of came in, well, that's great, but how, what are some tips for finding the three to five candidates in a market? Uh, okay, sure. That, that's, that's a lot of fun. That's my bread and butter. So T typically, what you're trying to do is, is like uh, Gabriella said, and, and like Doug mentioned, we, we want to figure out who our distributor is going to be. And um, I'll tell you what, like, when you take a look at mistakes people make, people make mistakes in choosing the wrong market, but they make a lot of mistakes in the wrong distributors. And a, a lot of times when I look back and I sort of forensically look at why people made mistakes, it's almost because they felt they didn't have a choice. So, so what happens, you deal with people who walk into a, uh, you, you have a trade show booth or, or, and somebody walks into it and says, hey, can I be your distributor? Or they send you an email and they say, can I be your distributor? And you go, sure, why not? I don't have a distributor in Mexico. I'll make you my distributor. I, I know absolutely nothing about you except what you're wearing today. I'll give you my future in Mexico, you know, for the next five years. Why not? What do I have to lose? And literally that's the way a lot of people do business like that, right? 
Um, and I've talked to people, you know, I, I, it, it's always sort of funny. People will send me, they'll say, I, I think this guy should be my distributor. I talked to him. He's fantastic. Uh, he, spe- he, he comes from Africa and he speaks French. And I'm like, you know, there are 500 million people in Africa who speak French. That, those are the, that's what you, why you think this guy should be your distributor, right? Um, and, and so he, here's the thing. Figure out who your distributor should be. And what do I mean by that? Um, I'll give you an example. I used to sell something that was installed in the walls of hospitals uh, during, typically during the building of a hospital or major renovations. Um, and it had a price point of about 500K. So I said, okay, who else is selling things that's installed in the wall of the hospitals during installation or renovation? costs about 500k can i find something else and i found other product lines that weren't competitors that were sold at the same time they were sold to the same people in the hospital etc right and then i said okay can i find distributors who distribute those products and that once you, once you think of it that way as, a, as that type of an exercise you can find those distributors and then you reach out to them and you basically say okay uh this is what i sell I give them a very good pitch, right? So what what I said is I'm telling them why they can trust me, why they're going to make money off of this and why it's not going to be a crazy amount of work, right? And then I have 12 or 15 distributors who want to be my distributors, right? So then I look at them and I say, okay, tell me about this, tell me about this, tell me about this. And usually I can come up with three to five. Now, I can... I could go, I could talk literally about this for eight hours, right? This is one, one piece of it, but th- this is sort of the, the trick is, first of all, never work with somebody that you didn't choose. Okay. And what do I mean by, you know, we basically, you know, I say, okay, do you pull names out of a hat? Do you throw darts to dartboard? How do you, how do you do this? If you are choose, if you are working with people who randomly approached you at a trade show, you're just throwing money in the toilet, right? Figure out who you want to be your distributor and go out and find that distributor. And it isn't that hard, right? And again, you know, reach out to, if, 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 you, if you want help with this, reach out to me. This is what I do. I help people with this. Thanks, Doug. Comment on that? Yeah, I just what? wanted to follow up on, uh, I was thinking about the way Zach was describing how people choose distributors in many cases. You know, we've heard of the sunk cost fallacy, right? The idea that I've made a bad investment and I keep throwing more money after the bad investment, hoping it'll turn good. This is an example of the no cost fallacy, which I see all the time. And that's true with distributors. It's also true with commission only reps where a business owner will say, well, I haven't spent any money on this person or on this business relationship. So how much harm can it, you know, be? If it doesn't work out, eh. Well, the fact of the matter is what you've just done is you've thrown away all the opportunity associated with that time, with that market position. Like the cost is enormous to allow yourself to fail because you were unwilling to invest to begin with. And so what I always emphasize when we talk about channel partners is, The purpose of having channel partners is not to save money. The purpose of channel partners is to take the money you would have spent on a salesperson or a team and shift it to providing support so that your channel partners can be successful. Distributors can sniff unwillingness to commit within a mile before they even talk to you. So you have to be willing to commit to a strategic business relationship to providing support. But then if you're willing to make the time and financial and strategic and marketing and training investment, then to absolutely, to Zach's point, this is a marriage, okay? This is not a quick date to the movie theater. This is something you have to be very careful about and take time. And you should identify, just like any other target account strategy, who the best players are, who are the A players, and potentially B players, because you may not be ready for the big league. You might be ready for, you know, uh, the minor league, but that's okay. They still get to play ball. So it's a matter of finding 
the right players who are playing at a level that gives you that balance between they have access to the market segments that we're trying to reach, but they also have capacity and readiness to work with us. And that's a delicate balance. Another area where a lot of people fail when they're developing distribution relationships is that they go after the, like my example earlier, the big electronics distributor, um, where they won the big uh, distributor, but the big distributor has 80 other companies on their line card. Why are they gonna make time for you? So actually in that case, we ended up, initially the idea was we weren't gonna spend any money because we had the big distributor. After three months of getting no results, the company finally agreed to let us dedicate a sales manager just to working with that distributor. He traveled to all the 40 different field sites, gave them individual training. We developed marketing specifically branded under them so they didn't have to create their own marketing. Then we started to see results. If you want results from other people, you got to support them in that process. And you got to partner with people who have some capacity and some willingness and some availability on their dance card to dance with you at the ball. So I think Zach's points are right on the money. And just keep in mind, don't make the mistake of the no cost fallacy. Uh, if I could just say, oh. I'm sorry, Zach. Let's just, I think Gabriella had a comment on yeah. that as well. Okay, only a, a comment. I agree with, with Doug and Zach totally. A big distributor, it's not always the great, the great one, even if he has a, a big part of the market because they have so many products that it's it's hard for them to 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 sell another one and something very special and very important that i do in mexico is do the due diligence do personal due diligence with my contact with my network to know what is going on with this distributor and second with a company that they do the due diligence from a distributor. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up on what Doug said, this is the way I like to look at it. So, so you go into a company that they are putting three people on the ground as, as selling, right? And those people are doing each 100 meetings a year, right? So you, you're getting 300 hours, 500 hours a year of, of sales. Now you bring on board 20 distributors, suddenly you have 2,500 hours of sales, right? You get those distributors to hire more salespeople, you get you know, 5,000 hours of sales. You add more distributors, you, so you suddenly get to the point where you're going from three or 400 sales hours that you can handle as a small company you're dealing suddenly with 100,000 sales hours, right? And, and the, the return on that is huge. And that, you know, so, so like Doug said, we're not trying to save money. We're trying to get more and more and more boots on the ground, right? And, and the more boots on the ground, you know, suddenly you take a look at it and you go, I don't understand this. For 25 years, we were selling a million dollars. And now suddenly we're selling 30 or $40 million. And you go, yes, yeah, because now we have, that many more, we have a hundred times more people out selling our product because we're working with better distributors. That's great. I, I would say that uh, each of you have kind of touched on some, again, some sort of process points. So back to the question about finding the candidates, finding potential distributor candidates. I think the work that, that I've been involved with, with clients looking to expand internationally, there's, there's a certain process that, that has been pretty repeatable and pretty successful. And a lot of it starts with an internal assessment of your own business, understanding your own strengths and weaknesses so that you can clearly define what it is you bring to the party. I think it's time well spent on developing a supplier pro profile. And you have to be very brutally honest with yourself. Can I do the thing that a supplier needs to do as an effective supplier to support a distributor? One, you have to mirror that with what does the potential distributor look like as opposed to the guy who comes into the trade show and says, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. And we've all heard that before. I can be your distributor in Mexico and many guys who go ahead and sign a deal or make a commitment based on that. But you need to spend some time based on your own business, understanding what a, 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 a distributor profile is. Then you save a lot of time when you start identifying prospective distributors, because you can quickly go through the checklist and see whether or not they meet the profile. And it requires multiple levels of investigation. But 
that's always been a very effective tool. And then again, uh, the, the ongoing assessment of the distributor relationship, you need to always go back and say, am I living up to what I committed to do as a supplier? Are you living up to what you committed to do as the distributor? Because it keeps people focused and energized on the relationship. So I want to, I want to kind of get a couple of other questions that we've got here. Um, a question came up also, this is a really interesting question too, about, uh, you know, we hear this from distributors that we've been working with for a while. Hey, you know, after they get going with the business, the initial plans, they'll, they'll say things like, well, you know, our country is a little bit different and we want to take us in a different direction. It may not just even strategically line up with what we originally thought or what we want to do. So how do you manage that when a partner has been effective and working and then they kind of are telling you, well, you know, I really think the business is this and we, we want to go in this direction as opposed to this direction that we had agreed upon, let's say. I'll We're take that, that if I sure, may, that's... just a couple thoughts. So first of all, you know, every business partner can bring good ideas to the table. So I think, you know, we talked about what are some of the key things it takes the steps to, to cross into new markets. The first one is humility. Absolutely. Humility, humility, humility. Okay. You don't know what you don't know and you need to listen to the people who know. Now, that doesn't mean that you take everything that's suggested to you as gospel truth and turn your entire strategy upside down, but it does mean you seriously consider it. You know, it, it, like in the Target example, they might have been more successful selling under a non-Target brand uh, initially in Canada after acquiring that company that they did and then slowly transitioning, but they were so convinced that their job was to become target in Canada rather than their job was to make money growing their business. Even Walmart has entered other markets, not under the Walmart name through joint ventures and other strategic partnerships. So, you know, you just, you have to be willing to consider creative directions that may involve a lot of the things that I see companies being thrown off by is they get told the packaging, the configuration, the nature of the product is not a good fit. And they're told, well, gee, you know, they're thinking to themselves, you know, that's a lot of expense. We have to redesign. We have to retool. We have to change our packaging contractor. Is all of that really worth it? Probably not always, but you know what? probably seven or eight out of, out of 10 times, it is worth seriously considering because you're not thinking strategically about the challenges and needs of that market. So it really comes back to the needs of the market. One way to help test that is to have a partner alongside your channel partners who's an in-market market research firm or other boots on the ground partner who can give you feedback. There's nothing wrong with hiring a firm to do focus groups or do phone surveys, talk to actual customers, have in-market people talk to actual customers, give you real feedback, find out what they need, see if that validates against the distributor's feedback. If so, be prepared to make the appropriate changes if you really want to win the day in that market. I'm going to give a counter argument to that. And I think, you know, we've, we've done enough agreeing so far, Doug. So, um, <laughs> That's here's, fair. Here's my take on it. I always say over 30 years in about 120, 130 countries I've sold into, I have never changed a product for one specific country. Okay. And, and I say that and people say, well, that doesn't make any sense because exactly what Doug said. Now, here's the caveat to that. I have changed a product, say for Africa, I have changed a product because the Japanese and the Russians both needed their alphabet. So we had to make a change to the software that would handle multiple alphabets, right? But what typically happens is you go into a country and they say, you know, in our country, we need this to be green. And there are two ways you can look at it. One is you can say, oh, I guess I have to make it green. The other one, you, you basically have to say, well, can I afford to do that, right? Is this going to work? Now, so, so I'll tell a very quick story. When I was little, I had a dog and I said to my dad, you know, if I had a pony, I could walk the dog better. And my dad said, well, that's, that's a good idea. And the poor dog almost died because at that point, I essentially stopped walking him, waiting for that pony to arrive. Now, if your distributor or your customer says, you need to make this green, you, eat, you have three choices. You can say, 
no, do you want to resign the line? You can say yes, in which case you better have a timetable for making it green. Or you can say, we'll see. Now, if you say, we'll see, that market is dead to you. You will never sell anything in that market again. Because what's going to happen is a distributor is going to say, well, why should I put any effort into it? He's going to change the product. I'll just wait, right? And if you can't change it, you're screwed. So, so if you have to decide if you can, can or you can't change. Now, every time I've said to a partner, um, I can't change it. Do you want to resign the line? They say, no, no, I'll figure out a way to sell it. And typically they sell it, right? So, so you got to balance that thing with changing for markets. That's, that's been my experience, right? Now, I, again, if you work for a giant company or you work with a, a very agile company, you can change your product. What I found is most American manufacturers of the size I've worked with, you know, say 500 million down, they are nowhere near as agile as they think they are. So when they say we're going to change a product, you're losing two or three years of that market. Whereas if you say find a sales solution, right? If, if somebody says, well, we really need it green, you say, well, have you explained to them all the other benefits and why the color isn't important? And typically they'll find a way to sell it. That, that, that's the way I look at it. So Zach, I, just a quick I actually agree that. with everything Zach said. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was told, uh, I, I, I was reminded, I was told early in my career by somebody who was a, had, had big company experience and this question came up about, well, this market is saying that they want green. And he said, Ernie, that was, we used to deal with this at Procter & Gamble all the time. We would tell customers, we sell red and we sell blue. And the customer would say, I want green. And we would say, no problem. You can have red green or blue green. So bottom line is you get red or blue and you can call it green if you like, take your pick. So those are, those are, those are tough calls to make. Uh, there, you know, I want to just sort of table one, one final question. I know we're getting short on time here. And this is not something that probably can be addressed by the group with the time we have remaining and might be a great uh, uh, topic for a future, a future uh, Globinar. And that is really, uh, we've talked a lot about entry strategies and finding the right distributors and getting into markets. What about, particularly when you're working with partners, an exit, what's, when is it, you know, what, what's the right exit strategy? And do we think about that, right? Is it a, is it I've reached a certain volume? Is it a margin requirement? When do I make that decision to either cut bait with a distributor, go direct, get out of a market? So I'll kind of throw that out there. And, and really for the person who asked the question, great question. We probably don't have time to get into a detailed discussion about it. But if anybody has some final thoughts about that, great. And can, then we should I, be just about wrapped up. Can I say one go thing ahead. about this, okay? This is, this is like uh, uh, any type of contractor divorce, right? You want to make sure in your agreement, you know how you're going to get out of it and you know how you're going to get out of it with the least possible pain. Now, again, I've dealt with about a thousand distributors over the course of my life. I have never successfully seen an American company get on a plane, fly to Nigeria and sue somebody. So we always have these, you know, you talk to manufacturers who are new to this and they say, well, we want to put this in the agreement and that in the agreement. So when it gets to court, I'm like, you are never going to get to court. What you want is to be able to get out of this agreement and not have them screw you over in the local market because they have all the, you know, we, we have all the rights over here. They have all the rights over there and they're going to own your name. They're, they're going to be able to shut you out if you don't have the agreement correctly to begin with. That's, that's what I'm going to say. Um, and, and like you said, Ernie, there isn't any time. Can I just say one thing? Because I am going to throw in a little pitch here. I'll talk to anybody. Call, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, please do. No obligation. Chat. The return on investment in talking to me and helping out, and I'm sure it's the same with Doug and Gabriella, getting an, an expert to help you out, the return on investment is crazy good because if I can save you 20 or $30 million in mistakes, or I can get your learning curve such so your sales increase within two years instead of seven years, anything you pay me doesn't matter, right? Literally, it, it, the return on investment is crazy. and my clock doesn't start running when you call me the first time. So give me a call, we'll chat and see if we can help you out, okay?
All right. Well, that's great, Zach. And thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Gabrielle. Of course, that's really the heart of the mission for the Global Chamber, right? The more we collaborate and exchange ideas, the better off and the easier we can and more successful we'll be. So I want to thank all of you guys for participating. Uh, for, those of, for those of you that were, were online and, and asking questions, if we didn't get to it, I'm sorry. We'll try to respond to those uh, uh, directly. There'll be a blog, I think, and, and a uh, link to this uh, presentation for those that want to go back and review it. And uh, I'll throw it to Doug Brunke for any final comments. But thank you guys for participating. Great, great conversation. Great job, Ernie. Uh, awesome information from all three of you. Uh, it's, it's a shame we haven't had a, a sales conversation in the last few months. And so it, I think one of the things that we indicated today or is very clear is we need to do this on a regular basis. This is a key topic. And when we've got three experts like we had today, uh, we've all uh, taken away some real key things. Stay in touch with Global Chamber. Uh, we've got actually four events this week. We have a little bit of a, a crazy timing one for US people tomorrow. Uh, let's disrupt, it's a three week series um, for those of us on the West Coast, it starts at 4 a.m., but it works out really well for Asia, Africa, and Europe. So uh, it's about uh, developing country, small, medium-sized businesses, what they need to be thinking about right now, and I hope you can participate. Uh, I'll be moderating at 4 a.m. on the West Coast. Um, not... Uh, that's that's a challenge <laughs> and for those of you in europe africa and most of asia we look forward to, to, to conversing with you uh, tomorrow take care everybody have a great rest of your day and week be global thank and you. unstoppable thanks have a great a lot. day guys thank you got you. it global and thanks unstoppable nice, nice to meet you all thank you